thank you for listening to this episode that is part of the Spark Media Network that can now be heard on the Edify app. So you lose the 20 pounds, you become beautiful, then what? Hey friends, my guest today is Dr. Julie Slattery, and we're going to go someplace hard. We're going to talk about what to do if your man doesn't like your body. Julie Slattery is a clinical psychologist. She's an author. She's a speaker. She's president and co-founder of a great organization called Authentic Intimacy, and we'll talk about that in the episode. Dr. Slattery's got degrees everywhere. She's got a master's in psychology, an MS, and doctorate degree in clinical psychology. She knows her stuff. You may recognize her from Focus on the Family. She was there for quite a while and even co-hosted the Focus on the Family broadcast between 2008 and 2012. But then she left to start her own ministry, Authentic Intimacy, and it's really a ministry devoted to reclaiming God's design for sexuality. There's a lot of great stuff there. If you haven't figured it out already, this may be an episode you don't want to listen to in front of your kids. And if this is a real issue in your life, I really pray that the words spoken here today will bless you. Reach out, get more help. Authentic Intimacy has groups you can join. There's other resources on my website if this is an issue for you. I hope you enjoy today's episode. And hey, tell a friend about it. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Dr. Julie Slattery, thank you so much for being on the Compared to Who show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I look forward to our conversation. Well, I invited you into a doozy of a topic, I'm afraid, but it's a real one. Yeah. And this is one that I get messages on over and over again. Mm -hmm. And there are so many women listening to this show whom I know have this question and never wrote me about it. So yeah. I could think of no better person to handle this issue with than you, uh, mm. you, do a wonderful job speaking grace and truth into issues like this. So thank you for being willing to tackle it with me today. Yeah, I'm glad to have this discussion. I know it's a tough one, but uh, this is the space that God's called me to. So, um, so hopefully we can encourage a lot of women in marriages through what we talk about. I, I hope so too. So let's just start at the beginning. Yeah. <sighs> The woman who feels like her husband isn't happy with her body, doesn't like her body. And let's, and I want, I want to segment this, right? Because I think there's a lot of women that feel this way and their husbands mm -hmm. never said anything. Yeah. This, so this is, this is just the way they feel. He can't possibly, you know, be happy with me because of this perceived body flaw. Mm -hmm. Can can you help us talk through maybe some of what's going there and, and some encouragement on that front? Sure. Yeah. Part of how we are taught to think about our bodies, particularly related to uh, attractiveness and sexuality is through a consumer mentality. Mm -hmm. So the most obvious example of this is pornography and how many both men and women have learned about sex through pornography. Um, you take a step even further back and you look at just how the media presents sexuality in the body. It's all about having the perfect figure and being beautiful and the right eyebrows and the airbrush makeup. And so we grow up thinking 
my value, particularly as it pertains to my body's value is, um, is whether or not it's an attractive commodity Mm -hmm. and you might not ever use those words, but that's what we think. We think, uh, you know, am I good enough? Am I prettier enough? How can I compete with this this woman that my husband works with? How can I compete with pornography? Mm-hmm. And so, even if your husband never said a word to reinforce that idea, it's already planted there. Uh, and most women have insecurities about their bodies, and all women have imperfect bodies. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we all have something that we can look at and say, man, I wish this were different, or I don't like this about myself. It's interesting to even read like the memoirs of these beautiful actresses and models, like a Nicole Kidman, who says that like she wrestled with body image all growing up and as a young adult. So it really isn't a measure of whether or not we're attractive. It's really a measure of just the poison that we've been fed that has set the frame for framework for how we see ourselves and think about ourselves. Right. And you use the word compete, mm-hmm. which I thought is it's that that's the way it's cashed out, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. In our brains, we feel like we're in this imaginary beauty contest, right? And if I can't win, like, well, why would anyone choose me? <laughs> right. Like yes. I'm second to last runner up or whatever, Yeah, but but it's not really a competition in our intimate relationships, is it, Julie? No, it's not. But we, but we sure feel it. And mm-hmm. social media, I think, doesn't help. Like, people will ask me all the time, just in ministry, like, "Hey, will you take a quick video for social media and explain about this or that?" I hate doing that mm-hmm. because I hate like the worry of. Do I look okay? <laughs> you know, like, is my makeup okay? Do I look old? Is my hair okay? I'd rather just do audio only because I don't have to worry about it. Or when I speak, uh, I don't want to have to worry about what I'm going to wear, but I do. Mm-hmm. I have to think about what am I putting on? How's my makeup? How's my hair? So this is part of our culture and it Mm -hmm. impacts everybody. But what God has designed within intimate relationships is meant to be a safe haven from that. Mm -hmm. So whereas everyone else in the world is going to have this consumer competitive mentality, can my home, can my marriage, uh, can our churches be a space where we get to take a break from that and we get to remember why, why we are loved and uh, where value comes from. And the whole message of the scripture is that we should be unlike the world. We should be totally different right. and we should be creating environments that have a, a completely different value system. Right. Right. I just remember, and, and you and I are close to the same age. I remember 20 years ago when Hugh Grant was caught cheating on Elizabeth Hurley. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Yep. And and I, I, I don't know why I wasn't in this line of work, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. I, it it made an indelible impression on my brain because I remembered thinking if Elizabeth Hurley, and I think it was the same year or maybe the year after she was named like the most beautiful woman in the world by people magazine Mm -hmm. or, or whoever Mm -hmm. names that. And I remember thinking if she can't keep her husband <laughs> faithful and that was those, that's the language I would, I would have used, right? Like yeah. if, if she can't keep a man, mm. like how do any of us have a chance? Mm-hmm. And it's, it, I'm not saying that was right thinking, but I think that that's where, that's where I was on my body image journey, trying mm. to be more beautiful, trying to, you know, find a husband, win the beauty contest, <laughs> win the competition, get married. And then I don't, somewhere in my naivety, I thought like, then it would just be done and I would be free from this, this yeah. horrible competition. And, and I remember seeing that, watching that play out and thinking, wow, there's, there's no way to win here. Mm. What, so the, the listener today that that's been in that competition, mm-hmm. she's been trying to win. She's been doing yeah. all the things she's been trying to lose the weight. She's spending the time at the gym. She's, you know, getting the parts fixed or getting the hair right or, mm-hmm. or whatever her hangout may be. Can, can you encourage her today? Yeah. I, I think first of all, I would say, okay, let's play that game. You win. Then what? 
So you lose the 20 pounds, you become beautiful. Then what? I don't know. Role play with me. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the, the irony is, so I was, I was a fitness instructor. And so 15, 20 years ago, everyone wanted to be skinny. And so mm -hmm. the losing the 20 pounds meant losing your butt. Right. Yeah. You want to get rid and of your now butt. we want it back. Now everyone wants it back. And I, I kind of feel bad for all those women yeah. <laughs> that worked their butts off because now they're yeah. trying to figure out how to get them back again. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it it is an now what? What do I do now? I did the thing that I thought would fix it. I lost the 20 pounds to to use your role play illustration. I lost the 20 pounds and I still don't feel like he loves me anymore. Right, right. Uh or it's an elusive race. It's right. like, now I've got to worry about the wrinkles, right? Um, you know, you're just going to add on to it. Now I've got to worry about my wardrobe. Is it up to date on and on? It goes, yeah. this is not a game you can win. It's not designed to win. It's designed to keep you chasing something that's elusive. Mm -hmm. And it's really designed to get us to, uh, even from a spiritual level, to invest our energy and our time in things that don't matter. So the greatest tragedy is when you think about how much of my adult life have I wasted because I was chasing this elusive whatever of being yeah. beautiful, of being fit, of being attractive. Uh, not that we don't care about our appearance. That's a different thing. But when it's driven by this fear of mm -hmm. I'm not good enough, um, then it's, it's a waste. Yeah. And what you said, Heather, even in your example of how you reacted to the Hugh Grant thing. And thank you for being transparent and honest. But you made this comment of if she couldn't keep her husband, mm -hmm. then do any of us have a chance? Mm -hmm. And right there is, is flawed thinking. It's not your job to keep your husband. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to keep your husband faithful. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think uh, a lot of Christian women have bought this lie that it's my job to keep him off pornography. It's right. my job to keep him enticed enough with me mm -hmm. that he's not going to have an affair. And now you do have, you do have a part to play in your marriage and then stewarding your marriage. Well, but that's a separate issue from his choices to look at pornography or to cheat on you or to leave the marriage. And it wasn't Elizabeth Hurley's job and it's not your job. Yeah. Uh, it's your job to be a faithful wife. And I think that that is a really important distinction that a lot of women need to hear because they're still walking around with that sense of fear and that burden. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we could do a whole episode on on the talks, I'm afraid I heard about the locked refrigerator, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, all, all those things, I can't even clearly articulate all of the different messages I heard about marriage and my job in marriage on that front, yeah. which it's all kind of ick right now. Yeah. But, but let can we get a little deeper? Cause I know you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> you're comfortable doing mm -hmm. that. What about the woman who says, but Dr. Slattery, I know if I just go get this surgery, my sex life will be so much better. Mm. How do you answer that one? Yeah. Well, first of all, there's no proof of that. Um, and you have to go back to, again, another lie we believe. What makes a great sex life? Mm. Not beautiful, perfect bodies. Right. And the only evidence we need for that is just look at Hollywood, look at pop culture, right. where they have all the plastic surgery they want or need. They have beautiful bodies to start with. They have the money to get hotel rooms that cost thousands of dollars a night and just live in this utopia of perfection and they can't stay together for more than a few months. Right. And so where did we get this idea that the way we physically look is what translates into great sex? It's just not true. Like the research actually shows that the things that contribute to a great sex life are things like faithfulness, um, long-term relationship, commitment, communication that have nothing to do with your body. Uh, and so we're neglecting the things that could create uh, intimacy and a great sex life by chasing 
these elusive things that actually there's no proof they do anything to help. Actually, in some ways, they contribute to this consumer mentality of, uh, I have to be attractive enough for my husband to still love me. It feeds that lie instead of solving a problem. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good. And I, and I know with women I've coached conversations I've had with women, just even in our ministry life. And then also my coaching too, there's, I think this tendency that as you try to improve your body to get your husband's attention, it's a lot easier to be trying to improve your body to get other men's attention too. Yeah. And, yeah. and that temptation just kind of naturally grows there. If he's not noticing, well, maybe someone else will, which mm-hmm. can create a whole new, uh, new set mm-hmm. of marriage issues. I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about the woman who just feels like her body's not good enough. Mm-hmm. What about the woman who's heard it? from her Mm. husband, where he's saying, I need you to change this so I can be attracted to you. Yeah. How, how do we minister to her? Yeah. And in this situation, I would say we need to not just minister to her, but we need to minister to her husband. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've spent like the past decade of my life teaching almost exclusively on sexuality And I've learned a lot along the way. And one of the things that I've realized is that most couples, including Christian couples, have the wrong way of thinking about sex. Uh, And we think about sex, again, from that consumer mentality. And we've just kind of Christianized the culture's view that, okay, I want to have great sex. So therefore, I need to get married. I need to find somebody I'm attracted to so that I can have good sex and get all my needs met. All right. That's a very worldly approach to marriage and sexuality. But if we're married, we say, okay, we're sanctioning that kind of thinking, which is Mm -hmm. wrong thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, You won't find that in the Bible. And so if you come to marriage with this mentality of God wants me to get all my needs met through my spouse and my spouse needs to accommodate my needs sexually, including what their body looks like, you are so warping God's design for marriage and sexuality that there's no simple solution to that. There's no one conversation that's going to solve that. And I'll tell you, if your wife does X, Y, and Z to make you happy today, it's going to be, let's go back to A, B, and C Mm -hmm. next week. It's never going to be enough. Hey, hey there, friend. Group coaching starts next week. There may be a spot available. It may be taken by the time you hear this episode, but reach out to me at heather at compared to who.me if you want to see if there's still a spot available for our group coaching session. Otherwise, I can pitch on the waiting list for the next time group coaching begins. Our Patreon community is going. I hope you'll join that at patreon.com slash compared to who. And hey, I wanted you to know I have a brand new five-day body image email challenge on the website every day for five days, you'll get an email to kind of challenge maybe some of the assumptions you have about your body image issues. I hope you'll take the challenge. Go to compare to who.me and press the red take the challenge button. If you even look at the whole industry of pornography, which is a multi billion dollar industry, is built on the faith in the fact that what you're consuming today will not be enough for what you need tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so when you take that mentality into marriage, you will say hurtful things to your spouse. You will have expectations and demands that, that the person you're married to cannot, cannot meet. And then you'll try to justify that with taking a few Bible verses out of context. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many marriages Mm -hmm. in that situation and so the problem isn't, oh my, now, now I'm feeling horrible about my body image because of what my husband said. The problem is we're approaching marriage and sexuality with a completely warped worldview. Um, and you know, my, my passion is to really help couples identify the lies that they've grown up believing and get a healthier view of, of what sex is actually meant to be in marriage and how you start building a healthy sex life. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. I can't promise that there's men listening to this show. <laughs> so, so what does the wife do? 
she's heard these things from her husband. How does she respond in a helpful yeah. way? Where, where can she start? Well, I think that there's different situations that might sound the same way initially. Mm -hmm. Like when you say, how about the woman who's, whose husband has said, Hey, you know, would you change this part of your body? There are good hearted men that are just very misguided mm -hmm. that are insensitive that again, have been <laughs> raised in a pornified culture, and they really don't even realize what they're saying is so destructive, but they're yeah. good guys. They're sensitive. There's other situations where you could be married to a man who is totally insensitive and uh, doesn't care if he's hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. And that is really more bordering on the line of an abusive marriage. Um, some things that a man repeatedly could say to his wife, can be emotionally abusive. And if that's the situation, it really, it really demands for you to create a crisis mm -hmm. and to say, I don't feel safe in our marriage. I don't emotionally feel safe. Uh, I don't feel safe with my husband and I need to get help and uh, don't try to navigate it by yourself. If you're in that kind of marriage, you really do need the wisdom and perspective of some godly counsel. And so if you're in that kind of situation, please reach out for help and get perspective. Uh, if you're in, again, more that marriage where you're married to a good guy, he just, he just doesn't get it. <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean by that. Oh, I remember, I'll just throw, throw personal testimony out there. Yeah. I remember when I've never been a big chested woman. Uh -huh. But I remember when I was pregnant with my first, he made some comment like, well, this is the greatest thing ever. Like you could work at Hooters and just, you know, that, yeah, <laughs> that's not who he was, <laughs> but I was it, that, but that little seed planted there was like, mm -hmm. oh, well, they're going to go back or they're going to deflate yeah. <laughs> after yeah, nursing, they do. <laughs> right? And, and so that little seed, he didn't even actually have to say, hey, I wish you had a bigger chest. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. that little seed gets planted and it, you know, and we all have great imaginations, <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we can keep those things for way too long and let them bounce around like popcorn. And oh, maybe everything would be better if I just, mm -hmm. you know, went and got implants. That would solve everything. And then he'd be happy. And even if he never said anything again, that little yeah. thought is there. So yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's like, no, that's example. good. How, how do, how do we, how yeah. do we control our yeah. thoughts? And <laughs> sure. And there's other examples and it's not just the men that say these things. I remember uh, early in my marriage, my husband had put on a few pounds and I said something to him about it. Like when we were intimate, and it really hurt him. Mm -hmm. And he told me like how much that hurt him. And I was like, I felt so bad, but I learned, wow, I need to be really sensitive. It's not just women who are sensitive about right. their bodies. Uh, and so it, this is normal. I have another friend who is gorgeous. She's got a great little cute figure. And her husband said something to her about, you know, you have a really nice figure. You could be like a 10 if you worked out. Mm -hmm. And she just was like devastated by that. Yeah. And so uh, there are, and then there are men again, good, good hearted men who are just very insensitive. Mm -hmm. um, they compare their wives to somebody jokingly, or uh, they're just careless. And in that sort of situation, uh, I really recommend you having an honest conversation and honestly just saying, you know, some of the things that you've said, I'm sure that you weren't meaning it this way, mm -hmm. but it really makes, it really plays on my insecurity. And I want, I want to work with you on how can we improve our sex life, including how do we give feedback to each other and work on it in a way that makes us feel freer, not mm -hmm. more insecure. Uh, so that's an invitation. It's giving feedback, but it's an invitation. And for most men, as soon as you hear the words, I want to work on our sex life, they're like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> Sign um, me up. <laughs> yes. Uh, and not, not every case, but in a lot right. of marriages that that is something a husband's willing to work on. He's maybe not willing to go to counseling, but he's willing to listen to a podcast about sex or read a book or say, Hey, let's, let's really focus on this area of our marriage. Now, once you get the buy-in of let's work on our sex life, I think the work that needs to happen is what I mentioned earlier, going back to the, de to the definition of what actually is a great sex life. Um, what, 
what creates a great sex life. Yes, it's things like playfulness. It's things like um, being able to enjoy each other. But the, the bottom line foundation of all that makes a great sex life is trust. If I don't trust you, I can't play. If I don't trust you, I can't let go. Uh, if I don't trust you, I can't share what I'm feeling in the moment. And so anything that undermines trust is going to sabotage intimacy. Yeah. And when you start making some of those connections, both you and your husband start realizing how important it is to build trust and to do the things that make you both feel safer and safer and safer in this area of your marriage. And any criticism, any criticism even backhanded comments about the body are going to make you feel more unsafe, not, not build the foundation of trust. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. What about, and, and this is another loaded question. <laughs> Julie, what about the woman who feels like my husband hasn't initiated sex in a long time. So that must mean that he's no longer attracted to me. I know there's a lot that could be going on there, but can you help, yeah. help soothe, soothe, soothe that issue a little bit or give her yeah. some, some possible steps to take? Sure. Yeah. And the, first of all, um, really addressing the stereotype that mm. in every marriage, the husband wants sex all the time. Mm. That's very important to address. So in probably about 30% of marriages, the woman actually has a higher sex drive than the husband does just in general. I, but then you add on to it all the things that get layered onto sexual desire and initiating things like stress at work, uh, depression, anxiety, the impact of illness and medication, insecurity. Like for, for many men to initiate a sexual encounter is a risk because mm -hmm. they feel like I put myself out there and what if she rejects me? For other men, this is a very real thing. If they've grown up with a history of pornography, they actually have trouble initially even getting aroused with their wife. Mm -hmm. And so they're afraid of that. Like, what if I can't perform? Or, you know, what if I don't, I, I can't get into it because I have all these, all these images of pornography in the back of my mind and I can't tell my wife that. Mm -hmm. And so sex becomes the secret compartment in his life that he really doesn't know how to bridge with his wife. So most likely the, the reason your husband's not initiating has nothing to do with whether or not you're attractive. Yeah. Uh, it's all these other things. It's fear, it's shame. It's um, even biology of low testosterone levels. It, it's so many other things, but this is again, where couples need to, to gain the vocabulary and the comfort level to actually talk about sex and to even have a conversation about, hey, I've noticed that you haven't initiated in a while. I just want to check in with you. How do you think things are going in our sex life? You know, where can we work? Where can I improve? You know, those sort of conversations. This is how I feel. Though, though, that's what builds intimacy. But, yeah. but Heather, most couples, first of all, don't have the vocabulary to start those conversations, and they're really afraid of man, that's so vulnerable. What if that kind of conversation goes south? I don't know if I could handle that. Right. Right. And I mean, I, you know, I, I try to protect my husband, <laughs> my husband's story somewhat on this mm -hmm. show, but we've walked through low T mm -hmm. and I'll tell you that my, and, and we also, he had a bunch of back issues and he was on a medication for years and years mm -hmm. that just zapped him in a number of different ways. And and I remember not having the vocabulary myself. I, yeah. I just, I, I was so entrenched in, uh oh, this is about me and how mm -hmm. I look and that instead of being able to have a constructive conversation, initiate a constructive conversation, it was more like, I would just wait until I got so angry. I was bubbling over <laughs> I'd be like, mm -hmm. I can't believe we haven't had sex in so long. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? You know, and it yeah. did not go well. Yeah. We used to call mm -hmm. it our Friday night fight. Um, oh, then, yeah. But, but we, you know, we, we were in counseling for a long time after that and it helped mm -hmm. us both quite a bit, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think that's, that's spot on. Just having those conversations is very difficult, but mm -hmm. very, very necessary. So what about the woman though, in that scenario, because you, you called it out, 
if he's been turned down a lot, Mm -hmm. it makes it harder. Yeah. And what if he's getting turned down? What if she's turning him down? Because I hear this all the time too. She's saying no until she loses the 10 pounds, the 20 pounds. She's saying no, because she doesn't want him to see her naked. Yeah. Mm. Can you, can you speak to her? Yeah. I, I would say, first of all, you're depriving yourself and your husband of a good gift mm-hmm. because of your insecurity. And I'd encourage you to ask the question, where did that voice come from? Mm-hmm. You know, like, is God telling you, you need to lose the two pounds in order or 10 pounds in order to enjoy sex? Mm-hmm. No, there's no way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if God's not telling you that, where is it coming from? Uh, and really take that seriously. You know, I really believe and have learned that sex is a spiritual battlefield. Absolutely. And we let the enemy win when we live by lies, when we believe lies. Uh, and in my own journey, one woman who's been like just hugely impactful for me is Linda Dillo. She co-founded Authentic Intimacy with me and has written some books on sexual intimacy. And here's this, when I met her, she was like 70 years old, 70 year old grandma, you know, like encouraging women about sexual intimacy. And she said something to me that has always stuck with me. She's like, as far as your body, it's not what you have, but what you do with what you have. Mm. Uh, Like God has given me this body. It's not perfect. It's going to continue to age and sag, but by, by God's good design, my husband is captured by my body. And when I use my body to love him well, it's very fulfilling to him. And if I can focus on that, he's not asking for a perfect body. Uh, he's, he's asking for his wife. He's asking for us to enjoy this together. And for too many years, I was depriving myself and my husband of the joy of what God wanted because I believed a lie. And there are an awful lot of women like that. Um, and if, you know, a 70 year old former missionary <laughs> can say, Hey, it's, it's what I do with what I have that matters. And like, right. well, I could do that too. That's a different mindset. And that really helped me experience a lot of freedom just from my own insecurities. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think that mindset, you have to carry it right into the bedroom as well. You do. Right. Like how do you keep yourself from, I think the word is spectatoring, right? Yeah. Like, like in the moment, are there some strategies that you can yeah. instruct women to, you know, oh, I don't want him to touch there or he touches that yeah. you know, spot on your thigh and then you're spiraling right. into, he sees how much weight I've gained yeah. or whatever. Can, right. can you help us out there? Yeah. So uh, it really is thought replacement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the way that I've learned to really understand this is if you imagine sexual pleasure as being a pathway you're walking Mm. and you keep taking steps and then you run into a stop sign or you run into a detour. And what you've trained yourself to do is stop. Like I can't go any further. I'm going to freeze or take a detour of, you know, I'm going to think about some experience I had 20 years ago just Mm. to dissociate because I can't be present or I become a spectator. What God really wants us to do is to tear down that stop sign. And we, we replace the thought of, I don't really want to do this, or he must be thinking that I'm so fat with a better thought, like even from Song of Solomon, which gives us so much permission to enjoy sex. Like some of the thoughts that I've learned to, to say in my own head is this is a good thing. I want this. Like, I want to be with my husband. I want to be naked with him. His body isn't perfect either. We love each other. Um, And I'll even pray like, Lord, help me to get over what I'm feeling right now. Help me to help me to focus on you. Help me to focus on my husband. Help me to enter in. And that phrase enter in has really has really come to mean a a lot to me because I do think women tend not to enter into the moment or into the pleasure of sex for one reason or another. But God's invitation for a married couple is to enter in. And um, sex is really like there's a lot of parallels to our relationship with God, but it really is like worship. So uh, so sex is sort of the way that we celebrate our love as a married couple, the same way that worshiping God, singing to him would be how we celebrate our love with God. 
And being a spectator is never worshiping. Mm -hmm. Like you can have the most amazing worship leader at your church, but if you're just sitting there watching, you're not worshiping. Worshiping means entering into the song and the words and lifting your heart, your adoration to the Lord. Now you're entering in. And there's that parallel that uh, there's a difference between sexual activity and sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. Your body can do what it's supposed to do and it's just activity. But for it to be intimacy, you have to say yes to entering in. And it's really just, again, shifting your mind. And Heather, that's why I go back to saying it's so important that we think about sex the right way so we actually can begin identifying where the enemy gets footholds. Yeah, yeah, that's good. You, you said two things in there, two, you used two words. Well, maybe you just used one word. You may have used both words. The one word was pleasure. I think mm-hmm. you also said satisfaction or, yeah. or my mind added that. Mm-hmm. Sure. But it was interesting. I'm, I've been digging into diet culture and, you know, that my body image journey, I think has led this, this audience of mine to a deeper investigation of, you know, things we've learned from, from diet culture and from our history of dieting and food deprivation. Mm-hmm. A lot of cases, a lot of my listeners come from a disordered eating, if not full-blown eating disorder background. Mm-hmm. And pleasure and satisfaction are things we've learned not to have. Yeah. Right? Like we have trained ourselves very religiously to not experience pleasure or to not mm-hmm. be satisfied by food. Mm-hmm. Any connections you can make there? To, to- yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I would put myself in that category. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've, I probably, I had disordered eating growing up and that diet culture thing and uh, self-deprivation and the feeling that I was a more disciplined Mm. and spiritual person by not enjoying pleasure. Mm. And that does translate into sex because it's a, it's a sensual, it's a bodily pleasure. Mm. And again, I think this goes back to, okay, where's the lie? Well, the lie is that God doesn't want me to experience pleasure. And then I'm, I'm a better Christian if I don't. That is just not mm. consistent with scripture. I was talking with a Christian sex therapist uh, a while ago and asking him about the idea of fasting, like fasting from food, but also fasting from sex. And he said, yeah, he said, the Bible does have some indication that, uh, that there's a place for fasting of denying ourself. But what he said next really surprised me. He said, the Bible ta- talks far more about feasting mm-hmm. yeah. and there are more feasts in the Bible than fasts yeah. and God's command that we feast. Yeah. And so there are some of us that we got the fasting thing down, <laughs> but we've never embraced the feasting, right. the feasting on the goodness of God feasting on the goodness of sexual pleasure and marriage. It, the whole book of Song of Solomon, why is that book in the Bible? Right. Of 66 books, it's the only book that is about a human relationship. And God chose to have that book not only be about marriage, but about sex and marriage and about sexual pleasure and marriage. Yeah. And so there, even in that one little book is the stamp of approval that God is saying, you as a married couple, I'm commanding you to feast and enjoy what I've created. And I needed to hear that message as a wife. I needed to realize that actually I was being disobedient by withholding the pleasure that God had given me to enjoy in the context that he gave me to enjoy it. Absolutely. That's so good. And I just, I'm just thinking, just as you've said, there's no mandate to wear a certain size or Mm -mm. look a certain way to show up to feast. No, (laughs) that's not in there. That's all extra, right? We put on ourselves. So that that's really good. Well, Julie, tell us like what's going on at the Java with Julie podcast. Like what have you all been covering there? So listeners can go over there and tune in. And is there anything big or new at authentic intimacy that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Yeah. Um, the podcast always, uh, right now we're getting ready to do a a series on making sense of God and sex. That'll be through the month of February, just grappling with what are the spiritual questions underneath our sexual struggles. Um, but we always have different conversations, whether it be on 
singleness or on sex and marriage or um, healing journeys. So um, all different things there. And then um, a book that I have coming out in the summer that I think is right along the lines of what we've been talking about. It's called God's Sex in Your Marriage. And it really helps couples, again, get that right foundation of how do I think about sex in the right way? How do me and my husband work towards what God designed sex to be um, in every aspect? So those are some of the things that we've got going on. Awesome. And I'll put links to all of that in the show notes. Well, Dr. Julie Slattery, thank you so much for being on the Compared to Who show today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching or listening today. I hope something in today's show has helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye. today's show blessed you may i ask a huge favor leave a review on your favorite platform seeing your five star reviews is a huge encouragement to me not sure how to do it you can go to compare to who.me slash podcast scroll to the bottom and you'll find all the information and while you're at compare to who.me check out some of the more than 500 articles on there about body image comparison all the things you're thinking about. Plus, you can find out more about my books or you can grab a time for a free 10-minute call to see if coaching is right for you. I'm so honored to be a part of your journey out of body image and comparison frustration, and I can't wait to hear how God is working to set you free.